Cognitive science is the interdisciplinary study of the mind as an information processor. That's sort of our mantra, right? That's like the foundational definition for how we think about cognitive science. We think of it as a study of the mind. And we've talked a lot about the mind. We've talked about what we think the mind does, what we think the mind is. I'm going to shift a little bit. We're going to talk about the brain. And I want to make sure we don't conflate the two. The mind and the brain are not necessarily the same thing. We talked about that when we talked about dualism and monism and identity theory. Identity theory is a subset of physicalism that says that mental states are equivalent to brain states. In other words, it conflates the mind and the brain, thought and matter. In physicalism, these are fundamentally the same thing. We don't necessarily want to say that the mind and the brain are the same thing, but I think that if we want to live in a universe where we can respect causality and where things are governed by physical laws, then I think what we're going to want to say is that ultimately all of the functionality of the mind has to in some way be physically caused by activity in the physical brain. And to that end, it's very useful for us to study brains. We want to know what's happening, what's happening in a brain when we're doing certain kinds of things, when we're performing the computations that we are interested in. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about neuroscience, the study of the brain, the nervous system, anatomy, physiology. And we're going to talk about cognitive neuroscience, specifically the structure and physiological processes behind specific cognitive functions. Not just why the brain is constructed the way it is, but what the brain can do. Yeah, this is big brain time. Why do we study brains? Well, we might just be interested in the brain for its own sake. We might just think, I just want to know how the brain works. I don't have any ulterior motives. But there are lots of other reasons we might be interested in brains. We might be interested in the brain and its functioning for clinical purposes. Maybe you're very interested in how we can solve problems like Alzheimer's and dementia or chronic brain injuries. Of course, you might also be interested in how the brain works because you might be interested in building a better version of a brain. Maybe you're interested in implementing what the brain does in a computer. Maybe you're interested in human computer interfaces creating machines that can interface directly with our brains. But maybe you're interested in the brain for another reason. Maybe you're interested not in understanding the physical brain itself or in the clinical applications or building a computer brain. Maybe you're interested in understanding the mind. This is where we find ourselves as cognitive scientists. And this is what we refer to as cognitive neuroscience. We are interested in not just the structure of the physical brain itself, but we are interested in understanding how the brain works and how those processes give rise to what we think of as our mind. Thinking back to those levels of analysis, David Marr, remember? We're interested in that computational level, the goals, the functions, that big picture description, the what, what are the computations that the brain does. We're interested also in the algorithmic level, those operations, representations, the specific steps the how, how the mind does what it does. But we're also interested in that implementational level, right? The physical implementation that executes the steps of the algorithm, where those processes take place, the physical system in which they take place. Cognitive neuroscience is interested in where cognitive processes occur in the brain. So we're sort of at that implementational level. We're not just talking about what the computations are. We're not just talking about what the operations and algorithms are. We're talking about where those algorithms and where those computations are executed in the physical meat space of the brain itself. And we want to know where those processes are occurring, where in the brain, where in a particular network of neurons, or maybe even within a neuron. Cognitive neuroscience is all about what's happening in the brain when you do specific mental processes like visual processing or pattern recognition or mental rotation or auditory processing or language comprehension or recognizing a human face or on and on and on. So many of these processes we do have to have some kind of physical implementation. They have to be executed in the brain in one way or another. So that's where we're going to be looking. We're going to look inside the human brain and see if we can find these processes, where they're happening, how they're happening in the physical meat space of our brains. 
Before we get into the functionality of the human brain, first I want to talk about the physical structure of the brain. We have to talk a little bit about structure so that we can talk about function. So I want to talk a little bit about the geography of the brain. What is the brain made of? How does it work? And I think the most important part of the brain for our purposes, when we think about how our minds work, is going to be the cortex. That's that really thin outer layer of the brain where we think we do most of our higher level cognition. Things like language and recognizing people that we know and remembering facts and solving problems. And in some sense, it's kind of the most recently evolved brain region. It's still very, very old. Uh, but in evolutionary terms, it is one of the more recent structures to evolve in our brains. And it's characterized by folds and crevices. Those bumps, those are called gyri. One bump is called a gyrus. And the crevices are called sulci, or one crevice is called a sulcus. And there's a reason that the brain is so wrinkly. There's a reason that it has all of those folds and bumps and crevices. And that reason is it maximizes surface area. Well, why should our brain be interested in maximizing surface area? Well, remember that that cortex is just a thin outer layer, but that's what we use to do most of the higher level complex kind of processing that we sort of take for granted, the things that make us human. Well, if you want to maximize the amount of computations you can do, if you want to maximize the amount of physical space that you have to work with, but all you have is a thin sheet, well, the best way to maximize how much sheet you can fit onto the surface of the brain is to make the brain really wrinkly. Give it lots of surface area by doubling back on itself and creating crevices and folds. So that's why the brain has that strange structure. It looks like a raisin. Um, that's not random. There's a reason for that. It's so that we can get the most cortex that we can possibly fit into a small physical space. Because it's the cortex that's doing all that really complex work that we think is so important. The brain is also divided into lobes. We have four general lobes. The frontal lobe, where we think we do a lot of our problem solving and language production. Our temporal lobe, that's on the side here, where we do a lot of auditory processing and things like pattern recognition and language comprehension. And then we have the parietal lobe that's sort of on top. That's where we do a lot of attention and spatial processing. It's also where our motor strip is located. And we have the occipital lobe in the very back. And we talked about this previously when we talked about vision and visual processing. This is where we process our sense of sight. Our brain is also split in two. We have two hemispheres, almost like we have two separate brains joined together by a fiber pathway. So all of those lobes are actually iterated twice, once in each hemisphere. And those hemispheres are sort of independent of each other, but they do communicate quite a lot through a bundle of fibers called the corpus callosum. That's what connects the two hemispheres together. And it's sort of like a switching station or a bridge. All of the communication from one side of the brain goes to the other via that corpus callosum. It's conveying information from one side of the body to the opposite side of the brain and vice versa. And there's something really wacky about the way the brain is organized. Now, I've talked about this before. I talked about how wacky it is that even though our eyes are at the front of our head, our visual cortex, our occipital lobe is at the back of our brains. That's a bit wacky. The information has to go all the way from the front to the back. And there's something even wackier. Information from your left visual field actually travels to the right hemisphere of your brain. And information from your right visual field travels to the left hemisphere of your brain. That's not just unique about vision, that's how everything in our brain is wired. Everything is crisscrossed. It's referred to as contralateral organization. Our entire left side of our body is controlled by our right hemisphere, and our entire right side of our bodies is controlled by our left hemisphere. So whenever you hear something through your right ear, whenever you use your right hand, whenever you see something in your right visual field, all of that is going to be processed in your left hemisphere. And anytime you hear something in your left ear, or you use your left hand, or you see something in your left visual field, all of that information is going to be processed in your right hemisphere. And there are a few other things that are located only on the right or the left, or predominantly on the right or the left. Quite a bit of language and speech is located in the left hemisphere. And quite a bit of our spatial visualization is located in the right hemisphere. 
So it's a good thing we have that pathway that can communicate from one hemisphere to the other, or else we might have a very serious problem coordinating our bodily activity. Taking in all of this information in our right and left visual fields, our left and right ear, all of that stuff has to somehow be bound together. And it requires our brain to send information from one hemisphere to the other in order for that binding process to occur. There's actually a really cool demonstration of contralateral organization. We can actually put each hemisphere of your brain to sleep. So a doctor can inject a sedative directly into one brain hemisphere or the other, and they can essentially put that hemisphere to sleep temporarily. It sort of invokes a kind of paralysis. The effect that this has is that it paralyzes the opposite half of your body. It makes it very clear that that brain hemisphere is controlling the opposite side of your body. And it has another interesting effect. When you put the left hemisphere to sleep, you lose your ability to speak and to comprehend language. In almost all of us, language is processed in the left hemisphere. Show me how you can wiggle your fingers. Keep on wiggling. In this test, in which the patient feels little discomfort, Jun Wada of the University of British Columbia first injects a dye opaque to x-rays into the artery supplying blood to the left hemisphere. This shows the route an anesthetic will follow when it is injected during the test. A similar series of x-rays seen from above shows how the dye, and hence the anesthetic, will flow only into the left hemisphere. It is vital the surgeon confirm where speech is located in each patient so that an intended operation to alleviate epilepsy can be safely performed. The test also shows that the left hemisphere controls the right hand. Now I'd like you to count slow and loud to 10 and back to 1. One. Okay. Don't stop counting. Two. Three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm. The left hand remains upright, controlled by the still conscious right hemisphere. Carry on. Speech gradually returns as the anesthetic clears the left hemisphere. One. Although 95% of the population has speech in the left hemisphere, there are exceptions. And for this reason, it is necessary to map the geography of each patient's brain to avoid interfering during surgery with such vital functions as speech and short-term memory. In a second test, a week later, the right hemisphere is anesthetized. Matthew, could you start uh, wiggling your fingers? Keep on wiggling, eh? And look straight ahead. You don't have to look at me. Look straight ahead. Okay. Now start counting loud and slow. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The conscious seven, left hemisphere six, has retained speech. Five, this is a really good demonstration of the fact that for most of us, for the vast majority of us, our language functionality is located in our left hemisphere. If we don't have access to that left hemisphere, if it gets put to sleep, we no longer have the ability to produce speech and we no longer have the ability to comprehend speech. Because that's the part of the brain that's responsible for doing that task. It's in the left hemisphere. So I, don't, I think that's really interesting. It's interesting that we can induce those effects just by putting a sedative directly into the brain itself. And it demonstrates just how important it is for that information to cross across the corpus callosum from one hemisphere to the other. Our brains is really sort of like two entities that are each processing information on their own 
and crossing that information back and forth, communicating with each other to give us sort of a holistic experience of our own lives. And without that communication, we wouldn't be able to take information through our left and right ears. We wouldn't be able to move our left and right hands together to do some kind of coordinated activity. We might not be able to even see an entire field of view. Because each of those hemispheres in our brain would be processing its own information completely isolated from the other. We really need that corpus callosum transmitting information back and forth in order for our experience of the world to make any sense. There's another interesting consequence of contralateral organization. It's called the right ear advantage. And the way this works is you can play messages or sounds into both ears at the same time. Imagine putting two earbuds into your ears and you're hearing two different messages at the same time, one in each ear. And you might be asked, pay attention to just one of the two messages. Like, oh, just pay attention to the message you're hearing in your left ear or just pay attention to the message that you're gonna hear in your right ear. And then later we might ask you about the content of those messages. So we might ask you about the content of the message that you attended to or the content of the message that you didn't attend to and we'll see how accurate your memory is. One interesting fact about this is that we tend to remember things better if we hear them in our right ear. Why? Why should that be the case? Well, let's walk through this. What's the pathway from hearing something in your right ear to understanding and then remembering what you heard? Well, let's imagine you hear the word dog in your right ear. And let's imagine you hear the word cat in your left ear. It's very simple, just two words, one in each ear. Well, the sound that goes into your right ear, that dog that you heard in your right ear, it's actually going to your left auditory cortex. It has to be processed in your left hemisphere because of contralateral organization. It goes down even to the level of what's going into each ear. The information that goes into your right ear is processed first in the left hemisphere of your brain. So the sound that goes in your right ear, you hearing the word dog, that's going to be processed in your left auditory cortex. Well, language is also processed in your left hemisphere. So that's a really short path to go from processing the sound to finding the meaning of the word. Well, what's happening to the word cat that went into your left ear? That's going into your right auditory cortex. This is a problem because language is processed in the left hemisphere. That means that now that sound representation that you created has to go back to the left hemisphere. It has to cross your brain twice. It has to cross first going from your left ear to your right hemisphere, to your right auditory cortex, where you just process the raw sound, where you encode it into a mental representation. And then it has to cross again to the left hemisphere where it can be processed by the language center, where you can find the meaning of the word. That's a very long path. It has to cross your brain sort of twice. This is why we have a right ear advantage, a much shorter path from the right ear to the left auditory cortex to the language center in the left hemisphere. That short path makes it easier for us to understand words if they come in through our right ear. And of course, this is true for vision too. We've talked about this before. All of the information from your left visual field is processed in your right occipital lobe. And I wanna be really clear, it's not all of the information from your left eye. It's all of the information from your left visual field, the left visual field of each eye. So each eye has two halves to its visual field, a left half and a right half. And for each eye, the left half of the visual field is processed in the right occipital lobe. And the right half of each visual field is processed in the left occipital lobe. So information from each lobe is traveling to the other hemisphere via the corpus callosum, right? Because if you want to process this information and make sort of a holistic picture of what you're seeing, at some point, it's, those two hemispheres are going to have to talk to each other so that you can get a full picture of your entire field of vision. If you only had access to the information being processed in the left occipital lobe, you would only ever be able to see the right half of your visual field. That would be a really big problem. So it has to take information from both visual fields, which are being processed in two different hemispheres, and at some point cross that information over so that you can get all of the information bundled together. So remember, 
that there are other functions that are localized in one hemisphere or the other, like language. Language is localized in the left hemisphere. So then what happens if the connection is severed? I've said a lot at this point that we really require that connection in order to create a holistic experience of our own lives. We need it in order to make sense of all the information that's coming in. What would happen if that connection was severed? I know the left hemisphere and right hemisphere now are working independent of each other, but you don't notice it. Now, you just kind of adapt to it. It doesn't, you don't have any feeling, it doesn't feel any different than it did before. Once Seven years ago, Joe had brain surgery to allay the effects of severe epilepsy. His surgeon cut the nerve fibers connecting his left hemisphere with his right. While the operation was a complete success, Joe's unusual case offers an extraordinary insight into the machinery of mind. This fiber system, the corpus callosum, is located midway between the two hemispheres. When it was surgically severed in Joe's brain, the transmission of information between the two hemispheres was halted. Michael Gazanica. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his dis disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Uh, right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. Grapes. Good. When Joe focuses on a point, Look right at the dot. everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. Look right at the dot. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, Tree. Joe is easily able to name right it. There we go. Let's see it. Close your eyes and. Let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Pan. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. But Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. What did you draw? Okay. What did you see? Wheel on one side, I don't know where I saw the other. So even though he can't name it, his left hand is able to draw out the picture right. of the stimulus of the picture or word that right. we presented to his right half brain. What did you see? I saw a hammer. So just close your eyes and draw with your left hand. Just let it go. That's nice. What's that? Saw. Yeah. What'd you see? Hammer. What'd you draw that for? I don't know. What we have with Joe is a is a is just a dramatic example of a neurologic case that really allows you this window into the non-conscious and how powerful non-conscious processes are at influencing our conscious self, our personal self. What Joe and patients like sure. him, and there are many of them, teaches us is that the mind is made up of a constellation of independent, semi-independent, uh, agents and that these agents these processes can carry on a vast number of activities outside of our conscious awareness even though that goes on there's some final stage or some final system which i happen to think is in the left hemisphere that pulls this all of this information together into a theory it has to generate a theory to explain all of this all of these independent elements and so, uh, and, and, and that theory becomes our particular theory of ourself and of the world. Cognitive neuroscientist Michael Gazaniga has actually done a lot of research with split-brain patients. 
He finds patients who have had their corpus callosum severed, and he does perceptual experiments. Experiments to see how they perceive the world and how they coordinate their motor activity and their language and their sensory inputs. And what he has found is something very, very interesting. What he's found is that that crosstalk between the two hemispheres is extremely necessary for us to build a holistic, conscious experience of our day-to-day -day life. Now, it may not be immediately apparent to people with split brains that they're having this kind of experience until it's put to the test. And Michael Gazzaniga has come up with several very specific tests that we can apply to split brain patients to see this in action. There are several variations on this basic experimental design. But the simplest version of it consists of just showing something to one half of the visual field. Then we can see if the split brain patient is able to articulate what they saw or whether they can draw it with either their left or right hand. So suppose we flash the word face in the right visual field. And then we ask them, what word did you see? Well, if we flash the word in the right visual field, that means it's going to be processed in the left hemisphere. Remember, the two hemispheres can't communicate, so whatever the left hemisphere has seen is going to stay in the left hemisphere. It can't leave. It cannot travel to the right hemisphere. And if we ask them, what word did you see, they'll be able to respond, because what else is in the left hemisphere? Language. Language functionality is in the left hemisphere. So if they see something in their right visual field, they see a word that says face, it'll go to their left hemisphere, it will be processed by their language center, and then they can articulate a response. They can say, oh, I saw the word face. If we ask them to draw a face using their right hand, then they'll be perfectly capable of doing so because their right hand is controlled by their left hemisphere. Now, if we show this to their left visual field, if they see the word face in the left visual field, and then we ask them, what do you see? They'll say, nothing, I don't see anything. Why are they not seeing anything? Well, the half of their brain that knows how to talk, their left hemisphere, isn't actually seeing anything. So when you ask them to tell you what they are seeing, you are asking that question to their left hemisphere. The left hemisphere is the only hemisphere that can actually understand what you are saying. It's the only hemisphere that can understand what you want to do, what you want them to say. It's the only hemisphere that knows how to say anything. So when you ask this question, the left hemisphere doesn't know what to say because the left hemisphere hasn't seen anything. So the patient says, I, I don't know, I didn't see anything. All of that information that they saw, the word face, it's in their right hemisphere and it can't escape their right hemisphere to get to the left side in order for them to articulate a response. But if you put a pencil in their left hand and you ask them to draw, they might draw a face. Why? Because the left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere, and the right hemisphere is what saw that word. That's really trippy. It's almost like there are two people living inside one body. It's like each half of your brain is almost an independent organism acting on its own. And this is why Michael Gazzaniga thinks that that crossing is extremely important for how we build a conscious experience. Michael Gazzaniga might even go so far as to say that there may be some specialized region in our left hemisphere that is responsible for giving us a conscious experience of the world. So what do you think? Do you think this tells us anything interesting about consciousness? Are these split brain patients aware of what their left side is doing? Maybe they just can't articulate it. Maybe they're aware of it. They just can't put it into words. But maybe they're actually completely unaware. And from Michael Gazzaniga's experiments, it seems that this is the case. They seem to be genuinely unaware of anything happening in the other hemisphere. So is there some kind of link between consciousness and language? Are both halves of the brain conscious, but separately? Maybe one half is conscious, but that conscious experience can't be articulated. It cannot be expressed by the other hemisphere. Maybe this, these people actually have two distinct and separable consciousnesses. Is that even conceivable? It's so hard to imagine. So they may be having two different separable conscious experiences, but only one of them can actually be described to someone on the outside. That right hemisphere experience is an internal experience. It cannot ever be articulated to someone else 
on the outside. It can only be experienced on the inside. So this is kind of like Thomas Nagel's what is it like to be a bat problem. Maybe split brain patients are having a conscious experience in their right hemisphere. They will just never be able to articulate it to us. They'll never be able to express what that conscious experience is like. They'll never be able to express what it's like having two conscious experiences. Because the only side of themselves, the only part of their brain that knows how to talk, has no idea that there is another separate conscious experience happening at the same time. It's just so hard to wrap my mind around that this might be the case. But it's something that we have to consider. So what do these experiments in brain lateralization tell us? They tell us something about the geography of the brain. They tell us that certain cognitive functions are localized in one hemisphere or the other, or maybe that some subparts are localized in one hemisphere or the other. It tells us that successful functioning requires communication between the hemispheres. And it may even be required for us to have a holistic conscious experience. And split brain research in particular tells us what separate steps and what processes may be involved to accomplish specific tasks, like being able to draw something, being able to say something, being able to understand a word. They tell us how those functions may be split across different modules in different hemispheres. And they tell us where those functions may be localized. But this is pretty big picture. We're not getting very fine-grained information from these kinds of experiments. So in the next few lectures, we're going to talk in more detail about functional neuroimaging, how we can use new technology to look into a person's mind without using surgery to see how the brain functions and where certain functions are taking place. Then we can get into much greater detail about exactly how the brain functions, how it executes our algorithms, how it creates mental representations, where all of these things are happening, what that communication across different brain regions is good for. Let's review the key concepts from this lecture. We talked about the geography of the brain. We talked about the cortex, that thin outer layer that's characterized by folds in order to increase its surface area. We talked about the lobes. Our brains are organized into four different lobes that sort of map to different kinds of functions. And we talked about the hemispheres. Our brain is split into two hemispheres connected by a corpus callosum, a fiber pathway that allows communication from one hemisphere to the other. We talked about contralateral organization, the idea that the brain is actually sort of crisscrossed. The left side of our body is controlled by the right hemisphere, and the right side of our body is controlled by the left hemisphere. And we can see a demonstration of this contralateral organization with tests like the WADA test, being able to selectively put to sleep one hemisphere or the other and see what kind of effect that has. Contralateral organization also results in right ear advantage, the fact that we remember better things that we hear in our right ear because it's a shorter pathway from the ear to the auditory cortex to the language center. And we talked about split brain surgery and split brain patients. That when you sever that corpus callosum, that fiber pathway that allows communication between the hemispheres, that results in a very unique experience for those patients. Without the communication, they wind up functioning as though they have two separate consciousnesses in the same body.